Hola, ¿cómo estás? Espero que estés súper bien. This is Tamara Marie, host of the Learn Spanish Con Salsa podcast. Now, before we jump into this episode, I wanted to let you know about a special opportunity that you're definitely going to want to take advantage of, especially if your goal is to become fluent in Spanish. For a limited time only, my team is opening the doors to listeners of the podcast to take advantage of a free language coaching session. Now, in this session, it's not just we're teaching you about verbs or grammar, but we're really going to do a deep dive into what are your goals for learning Spanish, assess where you are on your journey to fluency at the moment, and help you map out a 90-day plan for how you can get to fluency. So we are going to help you take your Spanish to the next level, whether you're afraid of speaking Spanish or you just get a little bit nervous when you're talking to native speakers, or maybe you've got some of the basics down, but you really know that you struggle with getting your Spanish to flow and your listening skills aren't up to par. Whatever it is, even if it is a specific grammar issue, we will help you map out how to tackle that. And normally these sessions do cost, so we are offering a few slots for free. There are limited spaces available and they'll only be open up through the end of the month. So make sure you sign up. Go to SpanishConSalsa.com slash coach. That's SpanishConSalsa.com slash coach to book your free language coaching session where we will help you map out a 90-day plan to get to Spanish fluency. Okay, let's get started with the episode. Bienvenidos! Welcome to the Learn Spanish con Salsa podcast, the show for Spanish learners that love music, travel, and culture. Close your grammar textbooks, shut down the language apps, and open your ears to how Spanish is spoken in the real world. Let us show you how to go from beginner to bilingual. Here is your host, certified language coach, Tamara Mari. Hola, bienvenidos al episodio 130. Welcome to episode 130 of the Learn Spanish Con Salsa podcast. This week, I'm bringing you part two of my conversation with Melissa Neacato, which is all about slow travel, how to really immerse yourself in a country when you go to visit, how she was able to do that with her family and afford being able to take these extended vacations and do slow travel even before retirement. So we're going to delve a little bit more into talking about how she was able to plan these trips out, what it took to do it, some travel tips and hacks that you may not be aware of that you might want to start implementing before your next trip. If you haven't already listened to part one of our conversation, make sure you go back to episode 129 and you'll hear how she came up with the idea to travel in the first place and why she chose Ecuador and El Salvador to travel with her family. Uh, She also gave some really great tips for those of you who are parents out there and you want to expose your children to Spanish. She gave some great tips on how to immerse your children in the language as well. So make sure you go back and listen to episode 129 before you check out this one. All right. So here is part two of my conversation with Melissa Neacato. Eso es algo que yo no sabía porque yo sé que creo que tienen es pupusa, eso es un, una comida de El Salvador. Uh-huh. ¿Y qué es eso? ¿Es, es como algo con, con queso, como pan o...? Oh, sí. Oh, perdón, quizás no la expliqué bien. Um, sí, las pupusas son... Lo haces con masa. So, empiezan en masa y las rellenas con queso o con frijoles o también le ponen uh, chicharrón que es carne de cerdo molida y de ahí las, las formas las hacen en círculo y, co- y son tortillas y de ahí las cocinas pero están rellenas y so, las pupusas son comidas típicas que haces rellena, rellenas de como dije, puede ser queso, puede ser um, frijoles, puede ser chicharrón o pueden ser mezcladas, pueden ser de muchas cosas. Y son tan comunes que son súper baratas. I mean, las puedes comprar por 25 centavos y son grandes. Wow. Y, y también la, las sirven con una, que algo que se llama curtido, que es como coleslaw en inglés. Es similar, pero no tiene mayonesa, es solo vinagre y col y cebolla y zanahorias. Eso es como algo que comes con ella. Y usualmente la, com- la, la comes con tus manos, no te dan um, 
tenedores ni nada de eso. Wow, ok, interesante. Y ahora yo tengo hambre, entonces <ríe> vamos a hablar de, de Ecuador ahora, porque... Cuando yo pienso en Ecuador, solo pienso en las Islas Galápagos, ¿no? Eso, solo he oído de eso, de, de Ecuador, y no sé mucho. Entonces, cuéntanos sobre eh, la experiencia de viajar allí y uh, pasar tiempo con tu, tu familia allí también. Sí, en Ecuador hicimos más cosas turísticas um, porque hay, hay mucho que ver um, ahí y... Hay también mucha gente que viene de los Estados Unidos y se mueven a vivir allí. So hay muchos, uh, hay más variedad en el tipo de gente que puedes uh, conocer cuando estás allí. En Ecuador, sí hay las Islas Galápagos, pero cuesta mucho para ir a visitarlas. So tuvimos que hacer cosas más locales que eso. So pudimos ir a Quito, que, que es la... The capital, la capital de Ecuador es Quito y pudimos ir allí y puedes visitar la, la casa que ahí también se, se llama la Casa Blanca, la White House, que es donde vive el presidente y es como un museo, puedes ir a visitar y so, hicimos eso con nuestros hijos y también uh, allí es, es más común hacer cosas en la naturaleza como um, hacer hiking. Hiking no es, that's not common at all in El Salvador. You tell someone you want to go hiking and they're like, why? <laughs> so era más, ya yeah, era más difícil encontrar algo hacer así en El Salvador. So en Ecuador es más común y so pudimos ir a lugares donde pudimos hacer eso. Incluso al Chimborazo, que es una montaña, que es la montaña más alta en Ecuador. Pudimos ir allí y tienen y, y puedes manejar bien arriba, so no tienes que caminar tanto um, para llegar a la, creo que se dice meta, uh, a, hasta arriba. Pero sí era, era algo era algo bonito, pero sí es una gran es, sí es un gran cambio de altitud y uh, desafortunadamente mi esposo no se sintió muy bien. Oh, <ríe> y so, wow. So, solo pudimos ir un poquito y de ahí teníamos que regresar a, al bus para descansar hasta que el resto de nuestra familia regresara de ir hasta arriba. So, allí en Ecuador tuvimos un poquito más de esas experiencias de cuando viajas a veces comes algo o te afecta más el clima. Um, ahí tuvimos más de esa experiencia porque sí hay muchos diferentes lugares. También pudimos ir a la playa, hay muchas playas allí y también hay, difer hay muchas diferencias en el tipo de comida que comes en, los dif en las diferentes ciudades. So, en la playa que nosotros y fuimos, claro, hay, hay, comen más um, mariscos, comen más pescado, um, pero también algo que ha hacían algo que, que era nuevo para mí, que yo no sabía. Hay una comida que se llama ceviche. Um, uh -huh. Y sé que otros lugares también hacen ceviches, pero en Ecuador, usual, usualmente en esta ciudad específicamente, se comen el ceviche con maní, que es crema de cacahuate esencialmente. Ahí lo llaman maní. Y so eso era algo nuevo, experiencia para nosotros, porque nosotros nunca habíamos comido ceviche con eso. ¡Wow! ¡Wow! Y me imagino también en Ecuador tienen palabras diferentes, acentos diferentes. Yo creo que en Quito hablan con... No me acuerdo exactamente, pero hablan con la F, creo. Que hay algo de, de su acento de, de, de Quito que es diferente, ¿no? Sí, y como dije, en los diferentes lugares es, es casi como los Estados Unidos, cuando vas al sur de los Estados Unidos, ahí por Florida, sí, sí pronuncian las palabras un poquito diferente. Yo, yo siempre pienso que uh, las palabras uh, más diferentes es cuando viene al, al maíz o al elote. Hay, hay muchas palabras que ocupan que son un poco diferentes en, en Ecuador. Pero sí, en las diferentes ciudades había un poquito de diferencia en las palabras, pero nosotros nunca tuvimos uh, like, uh, cuando estábamos hablando con gente, especialmente yo que tengo un poquito más de experiencia que mis hijos y mi esposo, no era tan difícil. difícil. A veces sí tenía que preguntar que un poquito más despacio 
So creo que es también un poco eh, la diferencia es la rapidez en que hablan a veces en español. La gente le gusta hablar bien rápido en, en algunos lugares. Sí, creo que en, en casi todos los países. Es como yo en, en mi país tenemos español más, más rápido con, <ríe> que los otros. Creo que es como una competencia y uno, eso es algo que no entiendo. <ríe> It's like, we all, I speak the fastest Spanish, like it's a race or something like that. <laughs> sí, sí, no, no, y es, I mean, eso es def, uh, definitivamente era la más grande diferencia que, especialmente para mi esposo que está más aprendiendo el español, está en un lugar más básico con su español que necesitaba preguntar que un poquito más despacio. <laughs> sí, sí, entiendo, entiendo. Entonces suena muy interesante. Ahora vamos a cambiar el inglés para hablar un poquito de, de la manera en que hicieron el viaje. So because this I know has to do with you know minimalism and, and talking about um, finances, um, I want to ask you about this part in English because I know that there's probably people listening here that think, wow, you know, I have um, a job, I have children, I have other obligations and I would love to spend a month in Ecuador and a month in El Salvador pero no puedo I can't right like I don't have the time I don't have the money so can you talk a little bit about how you were able to plan this trip and spend this much time when I think for most of us like I mentioned earlier for most of us I think uh, we'd be happy with two weeks of vacation a year <laughs> so how did you manage to do what I think You know, I think Tim Ferriss popularized the term mini retirement, right? Like where you would take extended time to actually explore a country instead of just visiting for like a week or something like that. Uh, so you talk about how you were able to accomplish that and how someone listening to this might be able to do the same. Yes, of course. So I feel like, I mean, you just have to have different expectations when you're going to be doing long-term slow travel and so I'm a big fan of slow travel and immersive travel because I want to go and really experience the culture I want my kids to really experience the way people live in those areas and so just having that mentality means you're going to approach it different and so when it came to money we did a lot of learning when it came to personal finance and so One of the things that we did first before we ever took this trip was that we paid off all our debt. And so I graduated college with $46,000 of debt. My husband graduated with college debt. And then we kind of followed that very traditional American dream of like, oh, well, now we need to buy new cars because we have our engineering jobs. And it wasn't till I found out about this a movement that maybe you've heard of and maybe you haven't. It's called FIRE, which is Financial Independence Retire Early, is when I really realized that I could do more with my money. I always wanted to pay off my debt aggressively um, and be out of my student loan debt. But then I didn't know what to do next with my money. And so for us, once we found that movement, it kind of really opened our eyes up to the fact that our money, instead of just buying us the next nicest car or the next you know, the new iPhone or whatever the new technology is, instead of co constantly upgrading our life, our money could buy us our time. And so that was really kind of the first step was making that shift of what do I really want to do with my day and how much money do I need to be able to do that? And so we aggressively paid off our debt. We were then we aggressively saved to make sure we had like a safety net. And then we started planning for uh, this mini retirement. So if I'm completely honest with you, my dream is to actually take like a year mini retirement and travel for a full year with my kids. But I knew that was kind of going to be a hard sell. My husband's definitely a lot more traditional when it comes to work um, and identifying yourself with like your job. And so I needed to have like something a little bit more palatable. And so that's why we came up with like a three month mini retirement. Something we didn't talk about here at all was that we also did like a 21 day road trip in the U.S. at the same time as this whole thing. And so one of the things you have to do, obviously, is if you're going to take time off is understand what your spending is. And so we track our spending every month. We go back and we look at where is all our money going 
And then once you have that understanding of where all, all your spending is going, you can then start to kind of pull things out of places you don't want to spend on so that you can have more money for, you know, the vacation or the wedding or taking a year off. And so the first step is always understanding your spending. And the way to understand that is to track it, to visit it. And so we have money dates every month to do that, that sort of thing. Wow. So I think it starts right with the decision. You know, you kind of said that you decided that this was something you really wanted to do. And you also talked about time, which I think is really important because people always think about, you know, you're going to work for a certain amount of time. You have, you have to put in the, the, the hours, so to speak. And then you'll get to retire when you're, I don't know, 70, 80 now. I mean, the, the, I think the date keeps getting pushed out for <laughs> when people uh, feel like they can retire because things are just so expensive depending on where you are. But it sounds like you were really intentional about deciding for you and, and really with your family having to make it as a goal that we are going to get off this treadmill, right? We're going to not always try to upgrade and get the newest and latest, but we're going to actually decide what's really important. So I think that's uh, an important part of it. But then there comes like the tactics, right? There's a lot of people that talk about travel. And I do want you to define what is slow travel because you mentioned that earlier. For, so for people who may not be familiar with like slow travel or immersive travel, can you, can you talk about what those are and then how you were able to sort of plan out these like two two months and, you know, a road trip on top of that? How are you able to how far in advance did you have to plan that out? Um, and, and tell us a little bit about that concept of slow travel. Yeah, sure. So to me, slow travel or just the concept of slow travel is usually when you go and you stay somewhere for more than a week, more than two weeks. You're trying to kind of fall into a pace almost. You're trying to feel local. You're trying to find a local shop. Create. You're trying to create a tempo and a daily routine when you're slow traveling. And that's why I said during the beginning part of the interview that we didn't do a ton of touristy things when we were in El Salvador at the beginning is because we were really trying to kind of get out of that uh, U.S. mindset of like, go, 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 go. Where's the next thing? What are we going to accomplish? We were really trying to step back and just relax and breathe and be with ourselves and be with our kids and just be present. And so that's definitely what the difference in slow travel as opposed to vacationing, which is like you're going with a purpose of like accomplishing something or seeing something and then going back home. And sometimes vacationing can be super tiring because it's so, you know, it's so high expectations, I guess. Um, and so for us, the amount of time that you need to like plan something like this really depends on what your goal is. Like I said, my, my goal initially was like a year thing. So my process took a little bit longer because I really had to edit it for myself and make it more reasonable and more manageable. But one of the things I did is that on the internet, I will share this link with you. I'll send the email um, to you. But there's something called Travel 101 course. And so I took this course so that I would learn a little bit of travel hacking skills. Um, I wasn't planning to like pay my whole trip with like credit card points or anything like that. Um, but I did want to kind of reduce the expense as much as possible. And so I did do this course, which is probably like a three, four week course. And then that kind of gave me a better understanding of like, when should I book my flights? When should I do this? Um, because these are low travel seasons. And so we ended up going during October, November, December, and the start of January for which included our road trip and everything, because we knew those were the dates that were like low season and so that the costs were going to be the least. Um, and so part of the, the, the tactics and planning, I would definitely recommend, you know, going through this course and then also just that that gives you a better idea of of how everything would work. And I am kind of a big planner. So I had an Excel sheet and everything with like, oh, OK, well, how much for the road trip? How many miles are we driving? How much is gas so that I could get a kind of estimate of like how much money I was going to spend on gas? How much money was I going to spend on food and accommodations? And so all these things are things you actually have to think about. So one of the benefits of to slow travel, too, though, is usually 
when you're slow traveling, you can do something to offset some of your costs. So, for example, for us, we actually ended up relocating during our mini retirement, and so we were not spending money on a mortgage and on uh, and on accommodations. So we only had one housing expense because we actually ended our lease and then took our vacation. But when you slow travel, like let's say you have a house already. A lot of people who do slow travel end up renting out their house, so that way they're not spending money on the mortgage and on accommodations at the same time. They only have the one expense.、And、so those are definitely little tips that can help kind of make the idea of a longer trip more of a possibility because you know where you can kind of cut some of the costs or transfer them to a different spot、um, that you wouldn't normally be able to do if you were just gone for a week. You might not be able to find someone who'll stay at your place for a week while you're gone. And so, about how how long in advance was it before? Like, so you said you did a lot of planning, you had spreadsheets. So, how long in advance did you start planning for your mini retirement? So, I will say, okay, so we took our trip in October 2017. Um, and I would say at least a year in advance for me because of the amount of things that I wanted to do, which, like I said, included kind of going through that course to learn a little bit of travel hacking. And the reason for that specifically was because with flights, sometimes、uh, the availability of them gets bought out really far in advance, and so you do want to give yourself at least six months to be able to get kind of the best deals when it comes to like flights,、uh, international flights. Okay. So, okay. so definitely a year. Like I said earlier, it was a little bit longer for me because adjusting what the plan was going to be.、Mm-hmm. Um, but once it was kind of clear what it was going to be, I would say it was about a year. Okay. Okay. So I would say, what is the number one travel hack that you learned from the travel course that you would tell someone if they were just thinking about getting started? What's the number one hack that you learned that really helped you really get into slow travel and plan a successful trip? Yeah. So for me, it was.、Um, I'm not a like a credit card turner person, but we really only opened up three credit cards, and then what we did was we just spent the money on things we were going to buy anyways. So that's that to me was like the biggest thing is like normally when you have a credit card, you earn like one you know one point or anything, but a lot of credit cards have sign up bonuses. And that's where you really get those big accumulation of points that then you can use to pay for flights or hotel rooms, or you can cash them out for for cash. But usually, that's the worst、uh, return on your on your points. The best is usually using them for airline flights. So that to me was like the biggest thing was that okay, well, if we're normally spending, you know, if you're normally spending like five hundred dollars on groceries and then another. Uh, $500 on your lights and your electricity and all these things, all these、um, expenses that you already have. When you sign up to a new credit card, there's a minimum spend. It's like $1,000 a month essentially, so $3,000 in the first three months. But then the sign-up bonus is what gives you all those points that made it possible for us to really、uh, get our air airline tickets for the lowest cost. Because I think that's where people will find the biggest expense, especially when you travel internationally. It's the airline costs, which was also a motivation for us to do the slow travel. Because I just couldn't kind of wrap my mind around tra- traveling to Ecuador for a week and then <laughs> spending that m- amount of money on the airline tickets. It made much more sense to, you know,、uh, you you technically cut the cost by staying somewhere longer. Yeah, no, I, you know, and I hadn't really thought about that before. I mean, I do know, you know, usually people try to, like I said, I mean, normal vacation, maybe a week or two, that people can get off work. But it's、uh, this idea of really staying and spending your time in a place and figuring out some creative ways to offset the cost. I think, I think is a game changer. It、right? kind of changes the way you think about travel from just being you know, like a tourist that's going somewhere for a few days to someone who's really. Um, has some time to learn about the daily life because if you're somewhere for a whole month, you sort of get used to that rhythm of being in the place and really get to experience it versus just like a week or so where you gotta, you know, turn back around and come back and you're jet lagged and you know you're、mm-hmm. it's it just feels so it feels like it's, it's such a jarring experience I think when you travel for a shorter time so. Very very cool. Well, Melissa, I want to thank you so much for taking the time 
to join us on the podcast and sharing a little bit about your trip and some of those travel hacks and definitely provide me with that link uh, to the travel course and we will add it to our show notes page. Uh, And if folks want to get in touch with you on social media and follow you and find out about what you're up to, uh, where can they find you on the interwebs? (laughs) Yeah, sure. Um, So everyone can find me at www.travelingwallet.com and actually I know I didn't really talk about it here but uh I have like a special thing for anyone who wants to kind of travel with kids and family and not have to have too much luggage we did it all with just four backpacks um and so it's www.travelingwallet.com forward slash capsules and I'll I teach people about like capsule wardrobes and then you can also find me on Twitter at Traveling Wallet or on Instagram at Traveling Wallet Roamer and yeah that's where I kind of share personal finance journey information and lessons and also more about minimalism and capsule wardrobes and how that helps you kind of travel light. (laughs) Definitely always needed, you know, especially internationally, because a lot of the, you have a lot of restrictions on the weight, right? How much stuff you can carry. So learning how to travel light is definitely a skill. So make sure you guys check that out. Uh, And thank you, Melissa, so much for joining us on the Learn Spanish Con Salsa podcast. Yeah. Thank you so much, Nemera. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Melissa and that you're inspired to take your next trip. Now, I do want to remind you that if you want the transcript to this episode, make sure you sign up at LearnSpanishQuanSalsa.com slash support to be a supporter of our show. And you'll get access to the transcript, not only for this episode, but for all 128 episodes so far of the podcast. So LearnSpanishQuanSalsa.com slash support. There's also a few other perks that you get and discounts when you sign up to be a supporter of the show. So I hope you will consider it and check that out. Now, if you have started thinking about travel again after listening to this episode, make sure you go back to episode 119. That'll give you five tips to prepare for summer travel to Spanish speaking countries. So there are a couple of things that I like to do when I'm about to travel that can really enhance your experience with meeting people as well as immersing yourself in the language. So that's episode 119. If you um, have the travel bug now and you want to listen to more episodes about travel. As always, to get access to any of the resources mentioned in this episode, links to all of Melissa's contact info as well, you can always go to our show notes page, learnspanishquonsalsa.com slash 129 for episode 129 of the podcast. I hope that something that you heard in today's episode has helped you go one step closer from Spanish principiante, beginner, to bilingual. Hasta la próxima. Thank you for listening to the Learn Spanish con Salsa podcast at LearnSpanishConSalsa.com. 